All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here today to talk about the AutoCAD Plant 3D tool set that is part of 2019. Uh, this is sort of going to be the introduction to what Plant 3D is. So if you've been using AutoCAD or, and this is your first time to have subscription to where you have these tool sets available, we're basically going to do a series of all the different tool sets over the next few months where you can see what they are, what they do, and get an overview of them. And that way, make a better decision of which one you would like to use. Uh, with the tool sets, don't be surprised if there's multiple tool sets that you see value in. For instance, my background is wastewater treatment plants, doing process plants of that type. So we would use uh, probably AutoCAD architecture for drawing our buildings, Plant 3D here for doing our piping and equipment, and AutoCAD electrical for doing our ladder diagrams and single line diagrams and things like that. So it's not unusual to see a need for multiple tool sets. Now, how to install those tool sets, those were covered in a previous webcast that you can go look at called What's New in AutoCAD 2019, and in that one, we kind of go through a review of how you install the different tool sets uh, once you have AutoCAD 2019 installed. Again, the tool sets are available as an add-on at no additional cost for subscription users. So let me turn on my screen here, and I'll minimize the view over here so that you can see it. So you should be able to see my screen right now. And with Plant 3D, everything works within a project. So you can see over here on the right, I have a project manager over here. Everything's working in a project because Plant 3D is working on top of a SQL database. So everything you do is being uh, placed in that SQL da database live. Out of the box, it's a SQLite database but you can use SQL Express or SQL Server, any of those if you have those already or want to install those in the future. But out of the box, you don't need a SQL Server because it is using SQLite. <clears throat> the drawings within Plant 3D are divided up into two areas. Uh, well, actually four areas, PNID drawings, your Plant 3D models, and then we also have what's called orthographic drawings and isometric drawings. And we're just going to go through a little overview of what this is. Right now you can see I've started with PNID open because this product is designed to work from PNID to the model and not vice versa. So it's designed best to work if you draw your PNIDs first. You do not have to, but there's not a mechanism for bringing information from plant into PNID where there is from PNID from plant. So that is uh, basically the way the product is designed. Looking at this drawing, you can see I've got a title block. It's all linked through the uh, project to my project information and my drawing information. When working with PNID, I'm going to move over here to paper space. You can see I've got all the different tools in my tool palette for working with these. I'm going to kind of do some drawing here while I talk. But here's some equipment. This is all out of the box equipment that you're looking at here. So some pumps, some exchangers, vessels, different types of storage tanks and things that are here out of the box. However, you can add your own custom equipment as you want, as you create it and use the product. Uh, right here, I'm just adding a centrifugal pump right here, and the first thing it does is ask me how do I want to tag it. Everything here has to have a unique tag. You can see I've already got a pump 1200 here, so if I tried to place this as pump 1200, it's going to give me a message that that pump already exists, so everything is unique. Everything is going to be uh, kept track of through the entire project whether it's in this drawing or not, is tracking the entire project. Whoops, I forgot to change it to 1300. So I'm going to change this one to pump 1300, place it here, and just place my tag right below it. So the intelligence is in the pump itself, not the tag. If the tag is pulling information from the pump, you have different types of lines you can draw. So these are the out-of-the-box pipelines and instrument lines. I'm just going to add a piece of pipe here, and I'm just basically picked where it was 
connected to and where it's going from. Now I put this one in as a 10 inch line because that's what I was set to currently using a carbon steel 150 spec. So if I put my cursor on it, you can see that it, it got the not only the pipe size and uh, spec, but also the line number from the line it was connected up to. While I'm working on this, I mean, again, you have just different types of lines for if you're doing jacketed pipe or secondary tertiary lines, all your instrument lines are here. It's very well developed at this point. So if I look at the valves, you can see I've got control valves, I've got different types of valves in the control valves. I could put numerous different types of actuators on them. I'm going to just basically be reproducing what's above there. So I'm going to place a globe valve on here, and what you'll notice is the globe valve was automatically assigned because I've got those set up in the project. They're set up this way out of the box to automatically increment the tag number on the valves. It also pulled the size of that valve right off the pipeline. So as you're adding the valves, it's going to number them and place them. You can always change them after the fact, but it has an initial system. You've got a full library of different types of fittings. You'll notice some of these have this hatching in them. What that means is because PNID and plant are spec driven. So what that tells me with that hatching is I can still place this strainer, but that tells me that I do not have a 10 inch strainer. I don't have any strainers in the out of the box spec. So it doesn't automatic, it's letting me know with the hatch in there that this, if I use this item, it's not in the spec and I probably need to add it to the spec at some point. But I'm able to tag the strainers. I can do that with any fittings. Here's a reducer. I'm gonna go ahead and place that while we're working. So I put it in a concentric reducer and you'll notice it says 10 inch by 10 inch because right now it doesn't know there's a size difference. But as soon as I go to that pipe and do the assigned tag, I can change the pipe size, keeping all the line numbers the same. I'm going to go ahead and place that. We'll just go ahead and place the line number above it. And you'll notice the reducer as well as the valve, both updated with the tag size or the pipe size when I set the, uh, told it what size it that uh, piece of pipe is. So there's a lot of intelligence going on here that's being stored in that database. And it understands that these are connected. So for instance, if I come up here, these tanks, by the way, right here, they're not there out of the box. If you look at the tanks, they're not here. I created those by taking an AutoCAD block that I had created years ago in vanilla AutoCAD, and I converted that in here into an actual tank symbol just takes uh, takes a few steps to do that and I turned this into an actual plant 3, 3D PNID object so that I could actually use it and tag it and it carries the same intelligence but I started with an AutoCAD block right here I can take these uh, this pipeline that when I select it, and you can see I can reverse the flow, I can uh, apply corners, I can break it, I can add a gap, which I'm going to do right here. And even though I added that gap, you can see it still considers all that one piece of pipe, or at least the same pipe. It may be T and N or something, but it's at least the same pipeline number, size, and all that information. You have off page connectors which are over here on the non-engineering tab and some different things like flow arrows and things. And the off-page connector allows me to connect a piece of pipe to another drawing. So just looking briefly at the heat exchanger drawing here, you can see I've got already defined this piece of pipe over here. And what will happen is when I connect these off-page connectors up, it will understand. You'll notice here before I connected it, I've got question marks here because it doesn't know the line number. But as soon as I connect it up with the, another drawing where the line number is defined, it will pull the information from that other drawing and it says, okay, this is the same line that's on the other drawing. It's the tempered water return. It knows what drawing it's on. So it's all connected up and has the intelligence to understand. And when I look at the drawing over here, you can see now it's got the line, the page number it's coming from already added to this drawing. So there's a lot of intelligence going on that's happening in the background 
through the SQL data. It is a live SQL database. So by that, what I mean is if I go ahead and annotate this pump that we added right here, and I'm just going to zoom in up here at the top and place it about right there. And so I've added annotation. It knows it's connected to that uh, pump. And if you notice, I have the information filled out on this pump, but not on these two. So I'm going to open up my data manager over here. This is where I'm looking at the exact SQL data. So it's every bit of data that is involved in this current drawing where I can look at the entire project data. I'm looking at it that way. So now I'm seeing that every, piece, every heat exchanger, piece of equipment, every valve, everything that's within this entire project database. I'm going to look at just the pumps here. I like to collapse them where I can see a little bit better. So I'm going to look at just the pumps here. And here's that data from the pumps. You can see pump one and two, I defined the description, but here's the one we just added. And in here, I can actually start to manipulate the data that I'm working on and actually pass it to multiple rows at the same time. Now, in the data manager, I can only work column by column. However, I could export this data to Excel, and in Excel, I could work column by column, row by row, and, and do things even faster. For this few items, it's probably a little bit faster to do it here in the data manager since it's just a few, but I'm just using the clipboard to copy and paste information that's within this particular two pumps. They're all three identical pumps, so I don't, I don't have to worry too much about uh, you know, whether this is the only real difference is the tag and the pump. But in addition, I can do it manually here. I've got a drop down list where I could set the status to demolition existing or new. Here I've got one. This is one I created and added to the project called paint for the paint color. And I'm going to be a little patriotic here, make it red, white, and blue as far as their, the way they're painted. But again, I could have exported all the data for the entire project to Excel and then worked on an Excel, imported it back in. I used to work with an engineer that loved that. He would just take those Excel files, modify them, and we'd import them back into the drawing and everything would update. And as I said, this is a live database. As soon as I updated it here, it updated my drawings. I didn't even have to have the drawings open. If they if that drawing would have been closed when I was doing that data in the data manager, the next time I opened up the drawing, I would see all the information filled out for for that those two pumps that I just copied and did in the data manager. So there's a lot of tools here for you dealing with the data, even the way I look at this on my screen. For instance, right now I am looking at my my drawing by layer. So I've seen the layers of what was used to create this drawing. But I can come up here and look at it by turning on my painter, and I am now looking at it, the colors by service. So all my process water is one color. All my vapor line, my tempered water return, and my drain, they're all the, uh, a specific color that I have assigned inside the project. I can look at it by color by size. And so now all my 10 inch pipe is red and all my eight inch pipe is gray. The six inch pipe is white and so on. So I'm actually seeing it by the pipe size. And based on that one I created of the color of the paint, I can view this by paint and see all my red, my white, and my blue line. And you notice the pump is blue since I set the color of blue to that pump after I placed it here. So you have different ways you can view it, different ways you can manipulate it, and it holds the intelligence of this PNID as you're working with it. Now I'm going to go ahead and close the PNID and we'll take a look at the Plant 3D side of the product. Right here, this is the structural drawings. So I'm just going to open up the structural steel drawing I've created, and you can see it's already fairly well developed. I need to change workspaces. That's got to finish loading up my pallets over there. So I'm going to change to the 3D piping workspace. I was in a P&ID workspace before. So now I've changed to my 3D piping workspace, and I have a, a whole different set of tools across the top here for my uh, pipe routing and equipment. And here's my structure tab. Here I've got 
all my different member commands, my grid, my railing, stairs, plate, footing, and ladder. So I have all these different structures I can create right here at the, within the structural drawing. I knew you didn't want to sit and watch me draw a bunch of steel, so I'm just going to put in one to show you how it works. But I'm going to also turn off my uh, concrete and my footings just to make it a little bit easier to see. Now, normally I draw these right on the grid, but this particular piece of steel I'm going to be drawing is actually going to be a for pipe support, like this one here. I'm going to have another pipe support. The top of steel of this is nine, nine feet. So I'm come over here and pick my member and go to my settings. Here you can see I've got all my shapes. Here's my C shape, my channels, my angles, got all my W shapes, my S shapes, pipe. Anything that you've seen in a steel catalog is pretty much here. There's been very few things except for some very unique shapes that I've seen in the past that is not here already in the database. Now this is going to be a W shape and I want it to match that one. So I'm just going to use the match properties to grab that information. And you can see it's a W8 by 18, set the material standard, the material code, the shape standard. Also the justification, since it's a beam, I'm going to work with top of steel. It draws just like AutoCAD lines. Let me go ahead and change this over to endpoint so I can grab the endpoint of that grid. And just like I would draw an AutoCAD line, I'd draw a piece of steel. Now I'm going to use this. I could have used O, o tracking to uh, track it up nine feet, but I chose to just move that piece of steel into position nine feet up for the top of the steel there. You can see I've got steel penetrating my column. But I've got tools for doing miters and cutting and things, so I'm going to go ahead and trim this steel back to where it doesn't show the, uh, where it's not going through the column. And you can see here it's stopping right on the flange on both sides because I have all these tools that are geared and made strictly for structural steel. I've got all my stairs. It makes a nice looking stair and railing and you can see the grading. Everything's here that I might need. Now I'm going to add a ladder in just to show you because I'm not going to go through and show you every setting here, but I'm going to add a ladder. But right here I can actually view this in different ways. And I like to use the line model view which shows me the center line of my steels where I can see that a little bit better, a few less endpoints to pick from. So that I'm going to set this ladder up three feet from the grid. Just to show you some basic settings here, when I go to the ladder, you have settings for your rung distance, what you're going to use for your ladder shape and your rung shape. In this case, I'm using pipe and how you define that cage, all the dimensions. Now I'm going to use all the defaults here. Just draw this thing along that grid. I'm going to place it right like that. Now I forgot to put it on the correct layer, so I'm going to put it on the axis. I'm still using AutoCAD layers for the structural steel. So you can use any layer system you so choose. Right here you can see I just moved it into place, but it created a ladder complete and entirely, just like I was drawing a line in AutoCAD. It's a very, very well designed software. I'm going to change back to shape model so you can see that ladder a little bit better. You can see what it looks like along with the railing up here and the grading. So it's a lot of intelligence has already been worked into these drawings before we ever, ever even touched them. Let's look at the piping. So I put my piping in my equipment in one drawing because it's a small project. There's, I could separate them into two different drawings if there's a larger project, but I just put it all in here. And I x ref the steel in here. So the steel has been x ref in here to where I can actually see that to work around. I've already pre-frozen some layers here, but I'm going to go ahead and turn a couple off here just to make it easier to see. Here's where that pump is going to go. I put a node here. Normally I work off the grid and let the grid and place it off that, but for speed and just showing you how it works, I chose to put a little node here in my drawing for placing this pump. So I'm going to actually place the same pump we just put in the PNID. I'm going to open up my equipment command here. And with the equipment, you will see this is all the out-of-the-box templates 
for these different types of equipment. Now, some of them have more templates than the other. For instance, if I look at heat exchanger, I got reboilers and the vertical down, the breech lock, different ones. And right here under pumps, I have a centrifugal pump that I'm going to use. All the equipment works pretty much the same way. You get, you can see the dimensions. I can take my cut sheet that I get from the pump manufacturer and start filling in any dimensions. I'm going to leave all this the out of the box dimensions, but you can see I can control everything about the pump housing, the shaft, the motor, all those I have dimensions for here that I could set up. This particular one again is going to be pump 1300. So I don't have to use the PID. I can just start with the plant side and put the information in that way. But once I've got everything set the way I want it, and I can save these equipment as templates that I reuse over and over again, especially if I start changing dimensions. I'm going to go ahead and place this one. Let me put this on node. And we'll place that pump there, and I can rotate it however I need to and place the pump in there. Connecting up the pipe to the pump, since I already have some drawn in here, I'm going to show you, I'm going to draw some pipe in a minute, but I just wanted to show you, I can, if the pipe is lined up, I can just connect it up. It actually put the flanges in on both sides, the bolt set and gaskets, everything it needs to be able to connect up that piece of pipe. And right here, because this is an 8-inch piece of pipe, my nozzle here, if I put it on there, is a 6-inch nozzle. So when I connect up this, this valve here to this nozzle, it knew enough to put in my reducer. I didn't have to go to the tool pallet and grab one and place this stuff one at a time. It knows how this is connecting up a flange. It's got to have a flange. It changed size. It needed a reducer. So it connected everything up that way. Now I can work off of a P&ID line list. So for instance, if I came up here, I'm going to open up my P&ID line list. This is all the information from the two P&ID drawings, my heat exchanger drawing and the process towers. This happens to be the PW1300, 8-inch eight, eight line. So I'll come down here and there's my PW1300, 8-inch line. And you can see I've got a check valve on here that's not shown in my drawing right now. And right from this list, I can just place that item and we'll place it on the node right there. It replaced the flange up here since they were flange to flange connection. It added the flange down here. It's, I can flip and change the direction of the check valve if need be, but it also automatically assigned the tag exactly like it was assigned on the PNID. So the intelligence is being passed from the PNID to the, to the valve itself just by placing it off that P&ID line list. Up here, I'm going to look at this heat exchanger up here, and you've got control of the nozzles as well as the size of your heat exchanger. I could modify the equipment if I needed to change the size or something, but let's say all I need to do is move this nozzle because it's a foot from the edge here, and I want it to be four feet. When I look at this nozzle, I can see that it's a four-inch 150 pressure class as I'm using a raised face flange. We'll come over here and look at the location, and I'm going to just move it from being a foot off the edge to four feet off the edge, and it moves the nozzle accordingly. For that, I'm going to go ahead and change this. This happens to be where my vapor line is going to connect, so I'm going to come up here and just change it to my vapor line. This will be a four-inch line because it's a four-inch nozzle. Got everything set here in my wire line number, my um, size, and my spec, and I'm going to route pipe right off of it. And just we'll go about 36 inches. I'm going to go down. I will say 15 feet, and then I'm going to change the plane here so I can come this direction another 10 feet. Now, when I say we're working off a spec, what we're talking about here is right here are the pipe specs that are I'm using. So there's different pipe specs for carbon steel 150, 300. I've got ductile iron, grooved, uh, pretty much any kind of pipe you can think of, uh, both metric and imperial. I've 
got this one down to where I'm just using two pipe specs. And whatever my active pipe spec is, that's what I see on the tool palette. So you can see here I'm looking at carbon steel 150. If I change to carbon steel 300, my tool palettes will update with that pipe spec. So I have anything in that pipe spec available to place from a tool palette. So far I haven't used that, but I will here in a minute. Right now, we're just going to go ahead and finish this up with another line coming over here, the same line off this tank. So I'm going to route right off of it. We'll go about seven feet that way and 10 feet this way. And the seven feet was just so I could make sure to go through this uh, trapeze support here, which we'll talk about those supports in a minute. But mainly what I was interested in, you can see here that this particular piece of pipe I drew off the tank with the nozzle is at a center of pipe of 38 feet. Right here, this one is much lower than that. And I want these to be the same elevation. So I can be really precise here until it yeah, I went too far. So center of pipe, 38 feet. I know those are at the same elevation. They line up now. If you notice the elbow stretched up with it, if I would have had a valve connected to this line, it would have stretched up with it also. So over here, I'm just going to connect these up and let the auto route finish this out for me instead of trying to figure out where that elbow goes. Let the software do it. it it'll line things up as long as they share uh, this uh, routing that it can figure out with the, particularly in this case, by the elevation. Over here, notice again, I haven't had to go to the tool palette. I don't have to erase that elbow and turn it into a T and place a T there and then connect up the next one. It has enough intelligence to understand when I start drawing from one to the other. It changed that to a T automatically, put in my elbow. I'm going to do the same thing over here. And I've connected up all three tanks to that same vapor line. Uh, converting those T's and elbows, let the software do the work. Over here, I've got these lines here where I don't have anything on it. So I'm going to, let's, I'm going to put some flanges on there. For that, I'm going to use the tool palette. I'm going to come over to the tool palette. Everything that's in the spec is here, valves included. In this case, I'm going to put a weld neck flange here. Doesn't matter about size. When it connects up to the piece of pipe, it will know what size to make that flange. So it also connects it up to the correct line number. At this point, I could easily just change this to a blind flange if that's what I needed, or maybe I don't need anything at all. I could just delete that mating flange over. But again, it, it, has, it knows what size that pipe is and what size flange to place on there at that time. I'm going to go ahead and turn all my layers back on. Pipe supports, you can see here I've got some hanging supports and trapeze ones right here. Uh, I put over here a, a hanging support. Uh, I've got some different types of stanchion supports over here. Take a look at the catalog for them. So I'm going to zoom in at the bottom and put a welded trunnion here. But first, we'll just look at the catalog. And you can see I've got a ton of different supports. So right here's all my different uh, ones that are general supports and dummy legs already in the catalog and ready to go. Here's some anchors and pipe guides that type. Here's my hanging support. So I have different types of hanging supports as well as trapeze. And here's my base support. So there's the clamp stanchion I had underneath on the beam over here. And I'm going to put a welded trunnion by just selecting it, come in here and place it right on that elbow. And that support was placed. My computer is saving my drawing there for a second with the auto save. Here, I'm going to go ahead and just stretch this support here to the top of this pad. And then if you look at it in 3D, you can see I've got the support sitting right on top of that pad. 
So you have all these different uh, items that are already here out of the library. Of course, you can always add your own custom ones if you don't find what you need. But I found the library for most of this stuff is pretty extensive, and a lot of it is already here. But that's basically how you would do a piping drawing. Just get the equipment in there and place your piping. Use that still as an XREF. I'm going to go ahead and save this. The other parts of the two parts of this product is the orthographic drawings. Now, the orthographic drawings are basically your construction documents. That one's zoomed in a little close. So there's me a general arrangement I created from the model. I'm going to create one here in a minute. Right now, it's just going to kind of let you see some that I've already pre-done. I haven't annotated any of these. They were just strictly to give you some views. I'm going to go ahead and open up the elevation here because this next one is uh, at zero elevation. It's going to be basically doing a section cut through here, looking down. So when I open it up, you can see I don't see the heat exchanger. I see the pumps, see the bottom of these tanks, a little bit of the ladder, but basically it's, I just did a section cut uh, through my model. Right here I'm seeing a section cut that has both a, where it's cut plus below what's happening below it because I don't see the pumps. So this one's actually doing a section cut that's looking down from here, but no further than right here. It's very specific about what it's looking at on this particular one. So you can do all different types of section cuts, different types of uh, match lines if necessary. Right here's a sheet 10. This is for my pump details. So I'm going to do a new view here. Now when I do this new view and select which drawings are going to be included in it, this is where I do those section cuts. So you can kind of see here, that I'm going to go ahead and load my GA one, which I'd already set up. Just This is the one I used to make that general arrangement, the first one. And then basically you set this up for where you want those section cuts to come through. So there's the one I did for the second sheet where I was doing from level zero. And so I can use this to create whatever view, top plan, elevation, any of those. Because when I did that elevation, it was basically just telling it, Hey, I want a front view right here. So there's where I created that elevation from. In this case, I'm going to do a pump detail area. So I'm going to go ahead and load. I predefined my uh, view cube so I wouldn't have to sit here and size it to this size as we were doing this little presentation here of the overview. But here's a view cube. So this is going to do a top view that I can see with the the red there, and plus it says top there, and I'm going to be doing it at half inch equals a foot. So I can set up any settings I want here. Once I'm happy with it, hit OK, place that viewport on my drawing, and it creates a 2D view that also has intelligence because it's reading the same database. But there's my 2D view of that particular top view. Now in this case, I want a front and a right, so I'm just going to Go ahead and create a front view right off of it. And I need to set me up endpoint here. So I can O track off of it. That way everything will be nice and lined up. And it creates me a 2D front view. Everything nice and lined up with the view above it. Likewise, I can create a right side view. So I get all three views that I may want of this particular detail here on one drawing. You can annotate these drawings. So for instance, I'm going to just zoom in up here. I'm not going to annotate the whole thing. But when I'm using the annotation, I'm actually pulling information about that piece of pipe from the database. I'm going to turn off my O-snaps because they kind of get in the way sometimes when I'm annotating. But I can pull off the pipe information. I can pull off, and here I'm just pulling off the line number tag, pull off equipment and just sit here. I missed that one, so let me get, probably need to make my pick box a little bit bigger. Over here on the valve, I'm going to grab the tag of this valve and place it on here. So I could go through the entire project here, uh, this drawing, and annotate till my heart's content. The nice thing, uh, let me go ahead and get the tag. I actually accidentally did the pipeline number of that pipe support. So if you put a tag on a pipe support, as I have here, you can get that information. 
column IDs. If it's in the database, you can tag it and pull that information on here. And it's basically what you put into it is what you get. So if you added it in there, you have the ability. Let's say I wanted the top of pipe. Now I've got the top of pipe there, or center of pipe. It's pulling everything from the database, bottom of pipe, that I might need for this. Uh, the top of the steel. I could come in here and say, give me top of steel, and uh, I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees and place it right here. So all the information that is available from the model can be transferred in here. If there's not a tag already for it in the product, you can create your own custom tags that can pull any piece of information. And as you can see with that pipe, I can pull multiple information and multiple uh, annotation from, from the same piece of pipe or the same pump or the same valve, whatever you want to use. Now I'm going to show the bill of material on this next in just a minute, but for now, so that it can be processing, I'm going to go ahead and switch over here to the isometric drawings. Here's uh, the isometrics. I'm going to look at it by drawing instead of by line number. Those are some isometrics I've already created. Uh, isometrics take a couple of minutes, so I wanted to go ahead and get it processing here while I'm doing the bill material. But here I can choose, like here's the line where we added the pump and the check valve, and here's that vapor line that we entirely drew just a minute ago. So I can create isometrics off all three of those drawings at the same time, or I could do the whole project or one at a time. Now it takes a few seconds here for it to create the, to, to gather the information, but once it gathers it, it free, I'm free up to do other work. So we'll let it take a second here to get that, and as soon as it does, we'll go back to the bill of material here on the ortho drawing. All right, so here on this drawing, I've already got a bill of material set up with the table set up, but you can pick and choose how you want your bill of materials to work with. I'm using one with a cut list, so I'm going to go ahead and just do a bill of material right here. Let's put this on the end point in the corner, and I'm just going to eyeball a size, and there's my bill of material for everything that's on this drawing. The entire drawing. Now I'm doing a cut list. If I would have done a simple one, it would have shown me the actual total length for each size of pipe, but I did it as a cut list instead. I can do the annotation for my bill of material by just selecting that bill of material. Now my computer just now stopped, kind of froze for a second because it's finishing up the ISO. There it goes. It's finished with the ISOs. But here I can start adding all the different bill of material information that I might want. And it's just going to go through and as I the entire bill of material and start doing it, I'm going to let it get to a point here where I can switch views right there. Just on item 15, it's doing something that's in a vertical line. It's kind of hard to see what I'm doing. That happens to be the elbow. So I'm going to go ahead and come up here and change the view to this one. And there's that elbow. So now I'm in another view place in that. I'm just going to escape out because you kind of get the idea. If I added another piece to any of this, it would update my bill of material accordingly. So if I added another piece of pipe, it would probably renumber this one to 18. But it would do that all automatically uh, as soon as I hit update bill of material. I accidentally placed a placed one down there. But as soon as I said update my bill of materials, it's going to update all my uh, bubbles as well. But it's all pulling from that database. That's the beauty of this product is the way it interacts with that database. Over here, you can see it's added in some isometrics. The goal here is to have an isometric that is complete. So I don't have to do a thing. So here my title block was completely filled out. When it created this drawing base, it pulled information from my PNID, it pulled information from my model in order, and from my project to fill out my title block. Here's the bill of material for this particular line, which is Process Water 1000. So I've got an entire bill of material. No hanging chads. Right here I've got my entire cut piece list for all my pipe. And you can see it's fully dimensioned. 
It's even got some information in here about how far it is off the column and it's coming from the wastewater treatment plan. I've got insulation, flow arrows, everything to let me know that I've put into my drawing. Like I said, what you put in is what you get out. So when you put this information into your model, it's going to be able to create an isometric in its entirety from that model. I'm going to go ahead and close it. No need to save it. It was already created. Here's that vapor line we created just a little while ago entirely while you were watching. So here's the isometric for that entire vapor line going from the heat exchanger to the three connections on the tanks and what tanks they're connected to. Complete with bill of material and cut list, title block completely filled out. I have nothing else I need to do on my isometrics. They're done. Now, this is not a complete out-of-the-box isometrics because I've customized a few things that I did want to see my coordinates, so I had removed those. I had my title block already set up, so and that's another webinar you can watch about the title block set up on the isometrics uh, that's on Hagerman.com under the webcast on demand. But this is all, once I get, get this set up to my company's standards, it's an automatic thing. You just create them and you're done. At least that's the goal most people, I believe, have with these isometrics. In addition, I have a tool such as validation. I'm going to go ahead and validate my project. Now, the validation is going to check for things that it sees that are abnormal. It will call them errors, but they're not necessarily errors. Some of uh, them were probably done on purpose. But here you can see it checked my PID and my model. And for instance, on the PID, it found these components right here, and it will open it up and zoom in on it. All right, so it found these components here on my PID where it says I've got an unconnected components. What it was looking for is a piece of pipe connected right here. Well, this is a relief valve, so that was on purpose. So I don't want it to do that anymore, so I'm going to just go ahead and ignore those because that was by design. Right here it says, all right, it can't find this valve. It says unmatched P9D inline assets. That means it cannot find this valve on my model. Now, in this particular case, I know that valve's there. Let's go look at it. That's this valve right here. If I put my cursor, just let it hang there. Notice this valve is V10,000 and the P9D is V1,000. I signed my tag wrong, so it can't find it. All I need to do to fix it is correct my tag here. Now, it's not going to disappear from my list here unless I rerun it. But that was just a mismatched tag between my PID and my model. Over here on this drawing here, I've got some valves that these aren't have mismatches. These valves I don't even have on my model, so I can't find them. That lets me know I need to go put these three valves on my model. Over here, I've got some unconnected ports. Now, here's that valve I just changed right here. Yeah, there's an unconnected port. It's not got anything connected right here. That was by design. I'm connecting up to something else. Someone is out of my scope, so I'm not worried about that one. I could ignore it. Right here's the drain line. Recognize that one as unconnected. Maybe I need to put a blind flange on it. Same with these two. They're just where I removed those flanges right here. See, this one didn't come up because I have a blind flange on it. So it recognized there was an open port I, that I might need to deal with. And here's a strainer. Remember I told you the strainer was not in the uh, spec? Well, it recognized that. And it point, is pointing out to me, hey, you've got a strainer that's not in the spec. It's a placeholder part. That's something I want to fix. So it's doing some checking of the what's uh, between the PNIDs and the plant and the plant model, so that I can make sure everything's shaking hands all the way through here. So that's just a very very valuable tool to have. In addition, I have reports, a lot of reports. Now right, this is the report creator, which is where I can view these reports. I'm going to set it to my project that I'm currently looking at. Currently, I'm looking at just the out-of-the-box report. So these are all the different reports that are out of the box. Usually, I, you, most people want to customize these, but this is a great place to start. So I'm just going to look at one of them here out of the box, the pump spec sheet. 
we'll do a preview on it. I can save these to Excel. I can put them into PDF files, whatever I want to do with them and however I want to use them for the project. So you see it's got the Autodesk logo. It doesn't tell me about much about the project. The tag is right here. Some things, maybe the insulation thickness. There's nothing about the paint that I added uh, earlier for the red, white, and blue. So it's got, but it's got other information that is in there in the database. So let's look at mine. I'm going to change it to where it's looking at the project report files, and these are ones that I've created. Now we'll hit the preview. Ah, I forgot to change it here. Let's. You have to reset it. Now we'll hit the preview. So there's the one I created. It's got my company logo on it. I've got the pump tag right up here. A lot more project information. I added my paint color. I removed the insulation thickness, which I didn't need on a pump in my opinion. But all that same information, I was able to get this defined exactly the way I wanted it to look for my company. And here you go, it's doing one for each sheet, which the other one was also, but there's the pump 1200, here's the pump 1300 that we added. So I got one for each sheet, and I can, again, I can print this to a PDF file or export it. Looking at a couple more reports, we'll just go down the list here. This is a bill of material report. I took the one out of the box, which was called 3D Parts, put my logo on it, a little more project information on it. I added a weight column so that it's actually putting in the weights of all these different items. That weight is calculated. Now I had to put the weight linear per foot in there initially for each size, but once I've done that, it, I've got it calculating the weights for me. Here's a, we'll come back to the drawing list. Here's the equipment list. So again, I just took the one out of the box, added my logo, some more project information. I think I added the weight column. Everything else was out of the, um, the supplier may have been or one of those. But again, it's just get, once the information is in the model, you can create any number of reports. This structural member one, I created from scratch yesterday just for today. It didn't even exist in the ones out of the box. But here I have one that I created that just has, again, some of the same information. It's sorting by the size of the structural steel. It's calculating weights. I did not go to the trouble of making it format in the decimal places or changing to feet and links. I did this one in a hurry yesterday just to show you I can create a completely custom uh, report that's not even there out of the box. Lastly, the drawing list when I took the one out of the box and all I wanted a drawing list for was the PID and ortho drawings. I didn't want to see my model drawings and stuff like this. Uh, I could have taken the time to add my isometric drawings in here. I, again, I did this one this morning just because I wanted to show a drawing list. So I just did a kind of a quickie one that gives me all the information on the drawing. And again, we can take this, do a print export, I'm just going to say OK. It put it in the report drawing file, so it's a PDF file, because that's the way I had that one set up. Right here, that went to the report templates, reports. So there's that drawing list I just created on a PDF file. So that I could send to anybody, and I could do that for the entire reports. But that's basically an overview of the product, of how it works, and what you can do with it and what it's used for. And I am gonna go ahead and take a look here at the questions, see if we have any questions. Give me a second to open that up. And to be honest with you, I don't see one question here right now. So does anybody have any? No questions. I am amazed. I've never had one where I didn't have any questions. All right. Uh, somebody just asked one. Let me see if I can figure out how to stretch this window a little bit where I can read it. Is grading actually grading or a hatch pattern? It's actually a hatch pattern, but when you look at the hatch pattern in shape mode, it views it as a 3D object. So it's using the, I, I was using the out of the box hatch pattern that comes with for the grading. And then it, I, when I'm in, if I'm not in shape mode, it just looks like a solid 
plate, but if I'm in shape mode, I could, it actually takes the hatch pattern and makes it into a 3D object for whatever thickness you told the grading, told it the grading was. There has got to be, let me see if I can pull this off and make this a little, there we go. All right, how can you import a line list from Excel? Well, when you're importing something from Excel, first you have to export it from, export it from Plant 3D. The reason being there's basically if you've ever used SQL, everything has a SQL ID. So when you export what you have in Excel, in the, in the project to Excel, it has, assigns those SQL addresses to it. You can't change them and then you can make changes and import it back. So you can't take a line list you created in Excel and import it in. Basically, you have to create the PNID or the piping, export it out, and then you can make changes and uh, import it in from that way. Out of the box OLETs. Yes, there are OLETs and weldlets out of the box that are already there. They're, in, they're actually, let me go ahead and show this real quick. I'm just going to minimize this screen. We'll minimize this. When you're looking at the spec, this is the spec viewer, so I'm looking at the actual spec. Uh, there should be, there's some socolets and weldlets being used right there. That all This is the out-of-box spec as far as this is concerned. The only changes I've made to this spec is uh, I added the weights and I removed some valves that I don't particularly use because I don't do butt weld valves myself, so it doesn't have the anything but flanged valves in my spec. But that's just because a preference that I had done that I, when I grabbed this spec. Shouldn't the Benford pump part number be? <laughs> Probably so. I can't, I use make-believe companies. Where did you assign the grid lines? That's in the structure tab. If I come over here to structure, here's my grid, and you can assign what your grid's going to be. I would do it in the structural drawing, though. And basically, like if I added a co another axis value here of 120 feet, notice it's A, B, C, D, E, F. If I hit the arrow, it added G. So the numbers are in the, for the names in the rows are all going to be automatic based on what you set up for your values for the grid when you create it. Can you create openings in the hatch patterns for pipe? Yes, you can. Uh, it is not, see right here you can see, it's kind of, probably kind of a little difficult to see, but I've got uh, uh, opening in my uh, grid here for where my heat exchanger sets on those two beams there. There's an opening for a hole there and there and three up there for piping. Uh, it's not something that most people know how to do. There are YouTube videos out there that show you how to do that. Uh, I particularly have an easier way that I believe is a lot easier than any YouTube video I've seen that is going to be available to you on Hagerman.com. Uh, here probably in the next month or so because I was I've been meaning to put that online for quite some time and uh, I just got assigned to do that about a week ago and um, so that will be on there of how I do it myself uh, I use uh, the boundary command in AutoCAD to be able to do that and it makes it real easy when you do it that way Instrumentation connections, they are there. Uh, you can see here I've got an instrumentation spec, and I had that coming in here. This is new to 2019 that they've added, the, maybe 2018, but I, I think it's new to 2019 where they've added the possibly 2018. I get my years mixed up sometimes, but this, this is new where I have an instrumentation spec and I can do instrumentation connections. Uh, also on PNID, it's been there all along there. Would this communicate with AutoCAD Electrical? Not exactly. I mean, you can't. Uh, as far as AutoCAD Electrical is concerned, this would be just a um, information such as the model information. You would see the drawing data so for spatial, but it's not going to communicate back and forth. Currently, AutoCAD Electrical only communicates with Inventor when you're doing wire, wire harnessing. I stepped away from it would generate bill materials for the structural members. I did that with the report. When I was showing the report earlier, I had one I created that was the structural member. You can also see this uh, all that in the data manager. So uh, 
down here you can see the steel structure here's all the structural members in the data manager it's just in a report it's actually a little bit more um, you can get just the information you want instead of every piece of information that's available because you know in my report that I'm going to send somebody they don't care about star X star X Y and Z and things like that so I could create those reports to do anything I need to are there any parts missing expansion joint strainer steam type pipe bend trimmed elbows <laughs> uh, a lot of those you have listed are there I can't say that all of them are because to be honest with you I haven't looked for an expansion joint for I haven't used one in so long I'm not sure I haven't ever looked for one uh, there are strainers that are there you do have a part creator if you need to create a part that's not in the catalog or database and for instance here's all the different ones that are there so like here's the strainer a swage valve why uh, expansion joint I don't see listed but I could add one if it's not because you can create any custom part you want you just got to add it to the catalog itself now expansion joint with that no, it's not there either. But it, there may be if you looked a little deeper, because you do have when you're in that catalog editor, you do have a lot of different shapes and stuff that you may not see. And sometimes I found they will catalog stuff a little bit different than the way my brain thinks of it. So it's possible. I know pipe bins are. You can also do cutback pipes and things like that. Uh, the reducing laterals and the, everything. Uh, no mitered elbows out of the box, but I have had clients who have created their own of those so I do know it's possible uh, so a lot of those are there how to integrate Navisworks as an XRF plus use those snaps to stretch pipe to model Navisworks files uh, you can integrate it with Navisworks manage to be able to do uh, clash detections and things like that I'm not sure what you are talking about by the XRF plus use those snaps to stretch pipe I can use those snaps to stretch pipe in here I don't believe you can do that on the Navisworks side I've never known of doing that but I'm not that big on Navisworks as far as knowledge to be able to answer that for definite in order to reference the PNID data of the plant, do you need to establish a database file in SQL or Access? This is an out-of-the-box option. It's an out-of-the-box option, uh, and it's not Access. It's all SQL. So SQLite out-of-the-box, but you can also use SQL Server and SQL uh, full-blown SQL. But Access is not what it uses for its database. Uh, but the PNID data, the plant data, basically you can as I said it works from PID to plant plus in the validation you can check stuff and you can also tell it to check in the validation more information than what is set up to out of the box so I could make it check to make sure manufacturers are the same in both PID and plant side does plant 3 have expansion joints I've already answered that one how did you create the line numbers or the line numbers out of the PID uh, it's kind of a combination what I'm going to suggest there is you go to hagerman.com there on Hagerman.com there is a article I wrote a few years ago that will be under the blog let's see if we can find it real quick so blogs we'll go to tips and tricks I usually have a link on my computer where I can get straight to it but I don't have it right here right now available so we'll go over here to the plant stuff and under here you'll see probably on the second or third page I did an article and this is one that has been very popular Autodesk actually sends a link to this article for anyone that asks them for information on that because they sent me a th thing requesting permission to do that a couple of years ago uh, but basically out of the box the pipeline numbers for P&IDs are like this you can set them up however you want to but they use a different system because Autodesk likes to show things with different systems and this article walks you through how to set it up to where when you finish the article your pipeline numbers will be all set up the same way to work from P&ID all the way through isometrics and orthos so this article covers that that's what I would suggest you look at for that slide uh, is there a video for importing AutoCAD blocks into project like you did for your tank 
No, I don't believe there's a video out there. There may be by someone else, but I've never done one. Uh, I usually, uh, we cover that in our quick ex, our quick start P&ID class, which is a one day class. And we cover that in there because it's uh, part of that one part of that class. Uh, but I don't believe, that, I know I haven't done a video, but there may be someone else out there who has. My P&IDs are defined with a unit field for the drawing number and line numbers. Using this setup, how can I reset the valve sequence to 01 for each drawing? Uh, you can set up the drawings to have what's called on the P&ID. I would set it out of the box. They're set up to use project-wide auto pro gen properties, uh, but you can change them over to drawing auto gen properties, and then each valve number can have its own starting point for each drawing. The catch there is you're going to have to set up your tag to have something unique. I usually attach the drawing number as part of my tag, but I don't make I make it an automatic thing to where that way they're unique because you can't have valve 1001 on one drawing and valve 1001 on a second drawing. So I would be drawing one valve 1001 and drawing two valve 1001. So there's a little bit of setup involved, but you can do that per drawing using the autogen uh, for the drawing properties. Best practices for sharing a central spec database across the network rather than on the C drives. Well, basically the specs are on your project. So each project has its own set of specs. So if the project's on the network, it's going to be using its own set of specs. There's, it's not looking at specs in a central location because most projects I may have one client that I have spec set up one way based on the contract with that client and another project where I have a totally different contract of set of specs. So those are per project. They're located initially on the C drives, but they usually should be the same out of the box for each person. So I customize them for the projects. But I could set that up on the network if I wanted to as a starting point. But usually if I'm starting from one project to another, I don't have to worry about that because it's pulling the specs from the project. Instrumentation library and catalog, yes, there is one. And it's out of the box. That's what I was showing here. It's using the instrumentation spec there. And here's the spec in my project manager for instrumentation. And it's pulling from an instrumentation catalog. Uh, some of the earlier versions of this product did not have that, but they do have that from about 2017 or 2018 on. Is there tube and tube fittings? Not out of the box, but you could go to the, I always forget the name of it. Let me look at the website name. It is your content packs under Autodesk apps.autodesk.com, you can go here, and there are some additional uh, catalog and specs that you can download here. A lot of them are for free. Some of them you may have to pay for it because if they weren't done by Autodesk, they're going to be, be something you pay for. But if they're on here, Autodesk has reviewed them and approved them. So like this two press tube and fittings catalog was created by this CAD group and they're charging $50. But you can come through here and find other ones the, that are made by other companies. Right here you see this um, this one right, well that's a trial. The, the, usually if you see this symbol here, it was created by Autodesk and there are some tube fitting type specs that are here in this apps.autodesk.com. How did you create your line numbers in the isometrics? Is the line numbers out of the P9D? Again, that article I pointed out earlier shows how to do that. Can I exchange this model with BIM? I'm not sure what you're asking there, but I'm assuming you're asking, can you share it with Revit? You can share an AutoCAD drawing such as this with Revit, but it's not going to have the intelligence. Revit uses a different database than, uh, than Plant 3D, so the intelligence won't be shared uh, from Plant to Revit. Can you files be exported in Plant AutoCAD? Yes, you, they can. You just there's a command called Auto Convert AutoCAD or pl Convert or something like that. I never can remember it. Let's see, Convert. But there is a command here for converting 
convert to AutoCAD. I can't remember the name of it. I'll, you can look at the help files, but there's a, uh, I think it's Plant 3D convert to AutoCAD, something like that. And you can convert these to regular AutoCAD objects for that. Well, model file export, I've got a lot of questions. I had none, and all of a sudden, a bunch. Will model file export to 3D PDF? Yes, it will, same way any other AutoCAD uh, would uh, create a 3D PDF. Can I route slope pipe? I forgot to mention that. Yes, you can route slope pipe. I'm going to go back to this drawing, and we'll go to this view here. And you can see I've got this drain pipe sloped. It's going sloped at an eighth inch every 12, every foot. Uh, but you also can slope pipe as you draw it, or you can slope pipe after you draw it either way. If you had a base plate on the steel, would it annotate the anchors, anchoring as well? No, it's not a structural steel detailing software, so that would be something you would need to use something like advanced steel for. Now, I can take my steel and export it to advanced steel right here uh, and then take that still in advanced still and start doing the details. So it's not going to show coping or any kind of bolt connections to do with the still. It's really creating the still for um, basically clash detection and spatial recognition, that type of stuff. It's not, it's not a still detailing software. After deleting components, you need to clean the database and purge it. Yes, there's a tool that comes out of the box with it called um, Data Cache Plant Data Cache Purger, I believe, and you can purge, you can run that from time to time to purge your uh, cache of anything that might have been left behind. But for the most part, it it's going to be fairly stable. It's just every now and then, especially if you have a lot, if you've been doing a lot of deleting, you may need to do that data cache purge. In a multi-designer project, are there any issues with extracting the ISOs from models being worked on? The only issue I know of in a multi-designer project is if you have more than one or two people on the project, then you probably want to use a SQL Express instead of SQLite. SQLite is a file-based SQL that it uses out of the box, like I said, but uh, if you are have you know, three, four people working on a project, you're probably going to want to have SQL Express, which means we would set up a SQL Server to do that. What is the best way to connect piping between two separate plant 3D models referencing one another? Uh, basically, you just connect them up. The only difference is it would be two pieces of pipe. Where they, unless they were connecting at a flange or something like that, but you can connect up the pipe just on the node from one node uh, of pipe in one drawing to the other just using the X refs and get them to stay connected on the ISO. Again, if they're in two different drawings, it's going to view them as two different pieces of pipes, so it's going to uh, list them that way and dimension them that way. So it's probably best if they're in the same drawing. Uh, most of the time, I keep all my piping in one drawing. If I was going to separate the drawings, I'd separate the equipment from my piping and then <clears throat> just uh, put all the piping in one drawing. I very seldom see the need to keep piping in two different drawings. Now, sometimes, maybe in a larger company where different, you have multiple designers working on it, then I would try to do it by system. So in other words, I may have one drawing that's all the pi all the drain piping, another one that's all the tempered water return, and separate them that way by system instead of trying to separate it by a piece of pipe on the same system. What command exports to 3D PDF? Um, it's the same one AutoCAD uses. I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not sure how to answer that. I believe it's a plot function, if I'm not mistaken, for plotting to a 3D, but you have to have a 3DF, 3D PDF print driver. But I'm not going to promise that's the correct answer because I'm not sure on that one. I just know it's possible, but I, I'm not sure on that one because that's an AutoCAD function uh, that I haven't dealt with. Any more questions before we come up? I've come to the end of the line as far as the ones there. I'll go ahead and put on my screen here some information about Hagerman and support and document management software. Can you talk about the coordination models in P3D? Uh, that I'm not sure what you're referring to, so I'm not sure how to answer that. If you could put a little more detail of what you mean by the coordination models, maybe I could 
answer that a little bit better because I'm not real sure. Insert as an XREF coordinate. Oh, you just insert it as an XREF. You just in the from the like that structural steel drawing. I literally right clicked on it. Insert to the current drawing as an XREF. They have to be shared zero zero zero. Everything has to line up on zero zero zero. But yeah, it uses. I had the XREF of the structural steel XREF right into my piping model so that I could use it. Well, we've gone a little long here, mainly because of the questions. We had 20 minutes worth of questions, people. I appreciate them all. I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley, and she will let you know some information here for the closing. Okay, thanks, Rick. Thanks for all the questions, too, everybody. Um, this will conclude our broadcast. If you uh, have additional questions that you think of later, you can simply reply to that confirmation or reminder email you received from GoToWebinar, and we can get those to Rick or the appropriate party to get your questions answered. Uh, once again, if you could take a few moments to fill out the short survey, we would appreciate it. It will just automatically pop up as we close down today. Um, thank you for attending, and have a great day, everybody.